so, so today, uh, it's a proud privilege for me to, to introduce someone who actually doesn't need an introduction. Uh, Keith McCormick is um, an author, uh, a consultant, uh, a frequent speaker at international conferences on data science. Um, uh, some of his, in fact, many of you may have seen him on LinkedIn. Uh, he's, a, uh, he's, a, he's a celebrity author who's published many courses on LinkedIn learning. In fact, one of the top 10 LinkedIn courses in data science right now and trending. Um, you know, somebody who has been spending uh, an enormous amount of time building machine learning models, um, you know, with the CRISP DM framework uh, since the late 90s. Uh, but somebody who also understands how to bridge that technology back into business outcomes. Uh, he's been a coach to hundreds of clients and companies and organizations worldwide uh, in helping them manage their analytics teams, uh, helping them set up uh, the right talent infrastructure, helping them hire right. Um, and so I think the topic today was uh, more apt than ever before. Uh, you know, it's pro probably one of the most burning questions uh, in, the, in the minds of many around the world, uh, you know, which is this whole concept of data science management. Uh, we hear a lot about data scientists, uh, and, and I think there's been enough discussed uh, about the career paths of a, uh, a technical, a statistical, a mathematical driven career path uh, in data scientists. Uh, but very little has been discussed and, and talked about data science management, uh, data science manager. And so today, uh, here we are with somebody who's a practitioner, uh, a global practitioner who's got purview uh, on how this is shaping up around the world. Uh, you know, and, and so, uh, you know, pl please visit uh, his site, keithmccormick.com. Uh, also follow him on LinkedIn. Uh, it's probably the fastest way to get uh, more insights, continuous insights from him beyond uh, just the session here today. Uh, you know, some fun facts for uh, Keith. Uh, he loves uh, hiking. Uh, in fact, uh, he loves hiking in places you uh, have never have heard of uh, and probably won't, won't uh, want to go and dare to go. Uh, you know, finding unusual souvenirs is what I've heard as well. And, uh, you know, traveling at exotic places, exotic foods. You know, it seems like uh, you're all set up for your trip to India, Keith, because uh, I'm sure, uh, you know, it will add to all of those collections of exotic foods and, and unusual souvenirs uh, when you're here. So, uh, so with that, um, you know, further ado, by the way, before, before I forget, uh, 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 he, um, he celebrated his birthday last week or I think two weeks ago. And, uh, you know, very happy belated birthday on behalf of all of us uh, at here at the Institute, but also the broad community here in India. Um, and I certainly hope uh, you, you get all what you dream and I hope you dream big. So uh, happy belated birthday. And uh, over, over to you, Keith, without further ado, uh, you know, uh, walk us through uh, and, and perhaps share some insights with the community on what you think are the top trends for data science management careers. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pinkesh. By the way, uh, oh, it looks like we just started a poll and I'm anxious to see those results. But also before I launch the slides, Pinkesh, I, I want to revisit the last question of the last talk. I know that for continuity's sake, we should repeat that because it's possible that um, the folks joining in this session didn't attend that one, but I think it's a great question. But why don't we let everybody complete the poll first? Sure. Uh, and I forgot uh, one of the important things we wanted to kind of do was to set this up. Uh, so you also have a feel for what's the current uh, thinking and the sentiment around this whole title of data science manager being the, being the title of the topic for our talk here as well. But what does that mean? Uh, and, and, and different, uh, different people, it may appeal uh, you know, uh, and uh, assume different things. So it'd be good to kind of see uh, what, what they mean by that. So it looks like the, the top trend is trending around. Their definition is a data science manager is more like a product manager with strong data science background. Great, very interesting. I'll be sharing, when I launch the deck, I'll be sharing a couple of comments about uh, the way that I tend to think of a data science manager, obviously an influence by the data science managers that I've worked with um, and um, I know at client sites and so on. So the, the question, uh, the, before I begin with uh, this new material, I did want to revisit that last question because it's a fabulous segue, I think, and to remind you and the audience on what that was uh, of the panel discussion that just ended a few minutes ago, 
was if you had to choose, these are always the tough questions, right? The if you had to choose questions, but if you had to choose, would you look for someone that knew the business very well and that had learned some data science or someone that knew the data science very well and learned a bit of the business? And I liked both answers from the gentleman on the panel. I thought they, what they answered was exactly right. Of course, questions like this force you to choose something that in the real world, you don't want to have to choose. You want to have a bit of both. But it inspired to make me a couple of comments about mistakes that I've seen companies make. Not so much mistakes that managers have made, but I think mistakes that sometimes corporations make in limiting the options of their own employees. And, and one is that I, I see this quite a bit. I don't know if this trend is diminishing or not, but it always disappoints me because I think it's unfortunate. There's a trend sometimes to have job descriptions that are so lofty and impossible to meet. You know, someone with uh, you know, five or 10 years of uh, an insurance fraud experience. And then on top of that, they have to know Python and they have to know R and they have to know these all, all these things. And, they, you know, it's impossible to meet that condition. The b mistake that I think is made as a result of that is they don't consider hiring from within. So I've seen subject matter experts make uh, do great in this role, in this data science management role. Um, one gentleman in particular that I always think of work the floor doing customs and border control. So inspections, you know, the, the drug sniffing dog, the x-ray machines and so on. When we were building a risk model, happened to be a, a trip to um, uh, New Zealand and not being an island nation, of course, there's a particular focus on produce and things like that entering the country. When we started to talk about what this uh, data science model would have to be, he got it right away because he could picture how it was going to facilitate what he had been doing for many years. So subject matter expert can be a great person in this role. Obviously a data scientist can also be, but here's the other mistake. The other mistake is what a lot of companies do is they say, let's take our number one top most technical, most sophisticated technically data scientist and take them away from the job they love and make them the data science manager. <laughs> you know, on reflection, it really doesn't make a lot of sense. Yet a lot of companies yeah. try to do it that way. What makes much more sense is to try to find the person on the team that enjoys the data science, but after doing it for two or three years, they start to think, wow, is this all it is? I, I kind of want to spread my wings and do something a little different. Mm -hmm. They will usually present themselves if they're just given the chance. So I just thought that was such a great transition into this topic that we should revisit. Oh. Very well, and I'm glad you. I'm I'm glad you did that. Uh, uh, you know, I, I think I see some questions bubbling up on the thread here as well. But I think we'll first let you uh, get going with your uh, your material. Uh, but I see a lot of uh, related questions to this topic as well, which I think I'll try to narrate uh, or paraphrase uh, on behalf of the community. I'm pleased to hear that, and I want to uh, say that I love the philosophy that you've all adopted at the conference. Uh, I wish I, I, I hope I do have the opportunity to attend in India sometime soon, because uh, that's not one of the countries I've had a chance to visit uh, uh, yet. But um, I do want to do one more thing before I launch the deck, and to talk a little bit about my career path since career is, you know, the subject today. And I thought I could just kind of do that, um, you know, informally. So um, I started doing this back in the nineties, as you can tell, hopefully um, everyone can tell visually that I'm not like uh, ready for retirement yet. You know, I'm still, I'm still mid career, but I've been doing this for quite a while because I started doing it right after uh, undergrad. So in the nineties, one of the things that was very different that people don't talk about so much, but it affects the way we organize our teams is that if someone was gonna be taken seriously in this field, you know, in the data science field, in the late 90s when I got started, there was really an expectation that you really knew your stats. That was the number one skill on the skill list to the extent that I thought for sure without a master's or a PhD, I wasn't gonna be taken seriously. And I know that that's always something when people are starting out in their careers, they think, wow, do I wanna go into cor corporate first? Do I wanna you know, do the degrees? But at the time I felt that that was really the only way that I was gonna be taken seriously. So I considered a PhD in psychometrics and it's actually why I moved to North Carolina and why I, I fell in love with the area, so I stayed, but because I was gonna do a PhD at Chapel Hill. And it was, as you know, uh, getting ready for that takes a long time. So. Uh, by the time I established residency, I don't know if everybody 
knows this about the way the U.S. is uh, is structured, but the states really are quite separate and distinct from each other. So even though I was born in the U.S. and, and lived here all my life, I had to take a year or two to become a citizen of North Carolina, as opposed to a citizen of Massachusetts. It sounds funny, right? And unless you've lived in the U.S., but I, I know many of you have. But uh, uh, you had to do that because otherwise I wouldn't get the in-state rates, and it was a big deal. But two years is a long time. So I started doing software training for SPSS, which is a brand that I think most people are still quite familiar with, but in particular, the statistics product. And the reason again was that back then, to be taken seriously, you really had to know your stats. That's how I headed on the path. So it's really somewhat of a, a twist and turn that led me here because in 99, I'd already been training for a while, SPSS Inc. bought a much smaller company that made the product that through many name changes and acquisitions has become IBM SPSS Modeler. And I became a bit of a, a world expert in that software. That's when I started doing data mining, predictive analytics, and so on, was in 99 because of that software acquisition. So because of that, and so few people knew this technology, after a decade or two, I didn't worry about the masters of the PhD anymore. But that's the kind of twists and turns that sometimes take you in this career path. So again, I've seen people come from subject matter expertise from the technical side. And of course, the technical side is not just stats. People don't emphasize the stats very much anymore. The technical side can also be IT. I found IT and BI professionals also be quite effective at this. So you really can come at it from almost any direction. So I think what I'll do now is I'll talk about the trends. And as I talk about the trends, they're more about, I think we're gonna ask a poll about how many people are already in the uh, a data science management role. Is that a poll question that we were gonna ask? Prankesh, if so, this would be a good time to do it. Yeah, now, now would be a good time to ask that, absolutely. Because then I'm gonna transition a bit into my comments and go into the slide material and talk a bit about, okay, you're in this job now, what are some of the trends out there in the environment that you can expect to see and have to deal with as you do that? So as you're getting that poll up, I'll make uh, one final comment about the twists and turns there. So Sorry. after about 10 years of some pretty heavy consulting, doing lots of different projects, IBM bought SPSS. And you can imagine now that changed everything because uh, SPSS had about 1,000 employees. IBM, rumor is, has more than 1,000 employees. So it, it really changed the whole culture of, uh, of also the client base, which was important. So for about a two year period, I've been an independent consultant most of my career, but for about a two year period, I was a VP of analytics for a small consultancy, about a hundred consultants, you know, so not tiny, but uh, you know, small to medium size, but most of them were BI consultants, a lot of forecasting, a lot of time series forecasting, but they brought me in to build the data science team and the more predictive analytics piece. And it, it was at that point that I started doing one or two contracts a month, you know, that my team was fulfilling. And that really forced me to scope a lot of projects and to think about what works and what doesn't work in, in doing that. So that was a kind of an important transition in my career. Looks like the team is still um, figuring this out. Maybe we can get started with the, Absolutely. With, Absolutely. With the deck fact, and then kind of ask fact, it at there's the a, end. There's a particular moment, uh, we can let uh, Sai know, there's a particular moment in the deck that will be perfect, and that will be when I get to, uh, uh, right after this uh, overview of the data science manager. And I know that we want to leave time for questions as well, but I've tried to keep the deck pretty straightforward so that I can be flexible and respond to uh, You should, uh, you should you know, share comments. the screen. Uh, oh, yeah, of course. Yep. Yep, very good. Yep, I launched the deck, but I've got to share it. Just a moment. There we go. Okay, so I wanna I wanna talk a little bit about what I witness most often among my clients. So I want to mention, you know, now that a lot of times when we think of data science, we think of, you know, LinkedIn and Facebook and Google. Realize that the kind of work that I've seen over all these years tends to be more of these medium-sized companies, banks, manufacturers, insurance companies, um, financial services companies, and so on, all with their own internal teams. So they're just big enough that they've got the uh, you know, the funds and the resources to hire a couple of data scientists, but we're not talking about companies that have a hundred data scientists. 
These are, you know, a data science team that's doing everyday uh, models for medium-sized companies. That's what I encounter the most often in my own work. So the data science manager role is truly new. And we've been doing these kinds of models for decades now, really. I mean, it, it, it kind of started in the 80s. I, was, uh, I wasn't in my career at that point, but it really goes back that far. So why is it that we've been building these models for all these years, but yet the data science manager role is new? Well, when I get to my trends, you're going to find that the first trend is going to help explain why that's the case. Why, for a very long time, data scientists weren't reporting to data science managers. They were reporting to other areas of the business. And I'm going to explore that in just a few minutes. But this critical, critical role helps translate business problems into problems that the algorithms can solve. You know, one of, the, one of the other trends that we're gonna be talking about is people rush too quickly to the algorithms. They rush too quickly to the modeling. The transla translation step is critical. And many data scientists are good at that, but some, especially if they're early in their career, sometimes struggle a bit. And that's why you need to have this role that interfaces between the business and uh, the technical folks that are building the models. And then, when you're more towards the end of the project, another critical, critical role that this person has to perform is to translate from the technical performance of the model. Senior management, of course, they're curious that the model is accurate, but model accuracy is not where it's at. Where, what's really, really critical is whether or not you're meeting the business metrics and whether the model is moving the needle, so to speak, and improving those business metrics. So as you can see, this role absolutely could be someone that is managing the project, or to phrase it a different way, in a way that many of you might adopt, that might be the product manager, okay? If this is going to be a data product, that absolutely is the case. But increasingly, really, in particular over the last five years, here in the US, uh, perhaps, it, it's kind of a somewhat of a new trend, but I'm starting to see more and more, and it's a, starting to affect my consulting in a big way. For the last five years, I typically don't work directly with the people that are building the predictive models. I tend to work with these directors of analytics, senior director, VP, and so on, helping them decide who to hire, how to grow their team, and so on, because this is now a position that's increasingly common. So sometimes it is you're managing the process, the project, or the data product, but sometimes this role is managing a team. And the managing the team version is one that I see more and more, although it's certainly not the only option. And um, I'm seeing teams a half dozen to a dozen, typically at these medium-sized companies, which I think tells you that companies are finding value in this because 10 years ago, they were teams of one or two or three, but increasingly I'm seeing teams of a half dozen or larger. So this would be a great time for that. Um, are you already in the role poll question if we have it? And if not, I'll continue. Yeah, I think we could continue, Keith, uh, because it's fair to assume that most of the audience here are aspiring to be in data science managers or based on some of the polls that we just took, uh, you know. Great, past. great. And, and you, we, have, we have several polls lined up quickly after your this, uh, uh, presentation, which will throw more uh, insight and, 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 and uh, you know, interesting questions around that. Fabulous. Okay, thank you, Sai. Okay, so now I've got uh, a handful of trends that I want to talk about. So this first trend, and I've got two versions of it. So when you see the next slide, it's not a mistake that I have trend one twice. You'll you'll understand why here in a moment. Um, when I started out in this, what I tended to see was that the data scientists reported up through the line of business. This was extremely common. You see this somewhat less. It hasn't gone away, but it's gone from maybe half the time to less than a fourth of the time, but it's still there. So you see data scientists reporting up through finance, sometimes uh, to the, uh, the CFO. You see data scientists reporting to marketing. I saw a lot of that earlier in my career. I had one project in particular where I reported to, um, as the model builder, I reported to the senior director of customer relations management. Why? Because he was essentially the product owner. But, and of course we still see that now, especially if you're 
uh, you know, an agile person or work in an agile shop, this, this idea of the product owner is a very common thing. But there really no, was no one else in the um, hierarchy that was responsible for the data scientists. Realize too that a complication that you see in data science, perhaps more than some other areas, is that you've got this whole issue of whether or not the data scientists are internal or external. When I started doing this some years ago, external was more common than it is. Of course, it's never gonna go away. Of course, you're gonna very frequently bring people from the outside to build models. But more and more companies are finding sufficient value from data and from these models that they're building in-house teams. Many of the companies that I was working for, let's say 15, 20 years ago, had no data scientists, zero. They would bring in external resources. That's really how I got started. They would bring in external resources to build the model and get some coaching on how to maintain the model. But when they needed another model, they would bring external resources in again. That was a very common model, less common now as people build the teams. So again, something you see less and less of is the data scientists reporting up through the line of business. And what you see more and more of is that it's centralized. Now, a trend that comes along with this, which I think is rather interesting and can be both good and bad, like almost any trend, it has both pros and cons. Part of what it might mean for the data science team to be more centralized is you have to decide which department that centralized organization is gonna to belong to. And you can probably guess what I'm about to say from your own experience. Very, very common that it's IT. So here's why I've listed trend one twice. If it is the case, particularly in my experience, if it's the case that data science and analytics report up through IT, there tends to be a differing perception about how to manage data science within the organization. So if you are an aspiring data science manager or a current one, what, who you report to within the organization, in my experience, is gonna change a lot what's expected of you and how your team is managed. If in fact you have a team as opposed to a product that you're responsible for. Okay, and what happens is, is that when data science reports up through IT, in my experience, it tends to be managed as a cost center. So the issue is, let's keep the team lean. Let's make sure that we don't commit to too many technologies. There tends to be a fair amount of pressure to you know, not have a dozen different predictive analytics tools because that increases the cost, not so much from licensing, but from maintenance, right? This all makes sense and none of it's inappropriate, but in my experience, back when it was managed up through the line of business, the projects tend to be treated as individual projects, each with their own budget and each with their own ROI. Now, anyone's influenced by their own personal history, certainly as I am. I think there were some wonderful benefits of this that we risk losing if we're not careful. I really do think managing data science as a profit center is important. And there's no reason why you can't run data science as a profit center within IT. I've just noticed a tendency that when data science reports up through IT, there's more an emphasis on the cost center and keeping the cost down. When I'm running a project, I'm very much about making sure that I get that profit. And one, one rough number that I always like to keep in my head is about a million US dollars because you know if a project's gonna run four, five, six months and I've got a handful of people that are part-time and maybe one or two people that are full-time and I have other expenses like infrastructure and software and training and so on, maybe even an external resource that I have to bring in. I just know that if a project is going to yield a million US dollars, I'm probably gonna have no problem um, paying for my team. Because when I talk about ROI, I don't, I, I don't, I don't wanna talk only about ROI like cash outlays or investments that we made during the project but I wanna count the salaries of everybody, including the data science manager. I want the whole team to be paying for itself with the projects that it does. So it's very important to me that data science is run as a profit center. And that was somewhat more common when it was line of business and somewhat less common when it reports up through IT, but there's no reason why it can't be 
uh, managed well if you think through the pros and cons of that. So I'm very ROI focused when I do projects. In fact, when I scope them, if I don't think the ROI is there, I usually recommend against doing the project altogether. Okay, another trend that I'm seeing. Now, again, this is more on the, you're in the role now. What are the trends that you might be seeing that might be influencing uh, what you need to think about as you run the team? This is clearly one that's different. And I gave you a bit of my personal history, a bit more of my personal history than I normally would, so that you could um, see where I was coming from in my own personal path. Uh, to uh, the work that I do now. Statistics used to be emphasized to such a degree, as I mentioned earlier, it was hard to be taken seriously without it. So what were the implications of that? What did that really mean? Well, one of the advantages of having a strong stats background is that you get very good at uh, being skeptical and by about spotting bias and data. So much so that when someone has a stats background, uh, they sometimes become that kind of annoying person in the meeting <laughs> that's that's always questioning whether or not you can uh, uh, you can trust everything, right? That's both uh, that's both good and bad. But here's the downside: back when data science projects were run by people with stats backgrounds, they tended not to finish. They tended to get bogged down, and uh, you know that was a real shortcoming because they would, were so careful about exploring the data and looking at every which way and really wanting only variables that were hypothesized to be related to the outcome, which is kind of a shortcoming when you're doing this kind of work. The projects would get bogged down and that's partly where we get this reputation that very few models are ever deployed. It was a real issue, okay? However, there were some advantages as well. So now let's talk about what we tend to see now, and I'm sure you'd all agree. In fact, R and Python have been so influential in what we do for the last several years that it's almost hard to imagine uh, the world of data science without them, okay? But what tends to happen when someone has a coding background? Now, I'm not saying that one conflicts with the other. It's not like you have a stats background or a coding background. I'm just saying that people that start out coding tend to have somewhat different emphases in what they do. So if the problem with the statisticians was they sometimes never got to deployment, there's sometimes a tendency among folks that start out in coding languages. Now keep in mind, what, what were these stats folks using? They tended to be using SPSS and SAS, which were absolutely dominant some years ago and have dropped in market share considerably, right? Also note that just because someone uses Python doesn't mean that they only use Python, right? But fair enough, we know that there's this huge trend with coding. So what tends to happen there? A real emphasis on algorithms and a real emphasis on deployment, both good. But I've often no noticed a de-emphasis of all the project phases prior to modeling a deployment. And that's the potential downside. So you wanna watch out for that. Also, if you're managing both products and people, if you find yourself in a data science manager role where you're actually managing data scientists, you wanna be careful, I believe, to make sure that you recruit a diverse team. Because if someone's training and background sometimes causes a particular kind of mistake or a particular kind of emphasis. You don't want everybody on your team to be a clone of each other. You want a diversity in their academic background. You want the diversity in where they have been recruited, both internal and external, and other things about their background as well. So I know we're gonna have some polls at the end, but did we have one that asked about Agile by any chance? Because I'd be curious to know how many Agile folks are on the, uh, on the call so, today. So e even here, uh, Keith, I would, uh, you know, hazard uh, a guess and say that pretty much most of the organizations that are represented here already, you know, follow Agile. Now, you know, we often say there is Agile and then there is Agile, but then I think yeah. uh, it's a very familiar uh, framework and, and application of that is varied in different organizations. So for our purposes, right. yeah. in that and, and, and I was assuming familiarity with, with it as well. What I was particularly curious about is how many organizations require it. Hmm. 
that's that's kind of um, I like the way you phrased it. There's agile and then there's agile. Like for instance, there's a difference between um, every two weeks we want to have some kind of measurable progress. There's that kind of agile yes. light, and then there's agile. If you yeah. know what I mean. That, yeah, that's yeah. that's what I was curious about. But perhaps we can talk about that after I finished my trends, yeah. which we certainly do. Okay, so so to be clear, everybody, that's what I'm talking about here. As I'm talking about an increase, agile. By the way, Chris DM, which um, I'm assuming that a number of you might not be familiar with, Chris DM and agile are almost exactly the same age. I mean, very very close in age. I think the the that uh, ski weekend when uh, agile was invented. I don't know if you've all heard the story, but apparently there was a lot of skiing and drinking involved that uh, that first weekend of the agile manifesto. There's some interesting stories about it. Um, I believe it was 2001. Do I have that roughly correct? Chris DM was completed. It was a three-year project, but it was completed in uh, 99. So they're actually similar in age. But certainly um, among the folks that we would interact with talking about data science or people that I would present to, I see many more familiar with Agile than Chris DM. But the trend that I'm talking about here isn't so much familiarity with it, not that it's a skill set, maybe something even that you're certified in, but whether or not the project is run primarily with Chris DM in mind or primarily with Agile in mind. That's, that's really what I'm starting to see, um, you know, as a shift. So let me just talk a little bit about Chris DM and where it came from so that the hope would be is that a data science manager would have some familiarity with both so that you could draw upon the decades of experience we have specifically with predictive modeling projects, but how to perform those projects while living in an agile world or working within an organization where Agile was a requirement, right? So let me tell you a little bit about the one that you're probably less familiar with, Chris DM. So this is the diagram that many, many people have seen. So the problem is sometimes that people assume that what you're looking at on the screen right now is Chris DM. Uh, to, to rephrase your comment side, perhaps we could say, there's Chris DM and then there's Chris DM, okay? <laughs> Anyway, uh, so here's getting back to that trend that I mentioned a moment ago, trend number two, if you all recall, was that people tend to arrive with less stats experience and more coding experience. Now, if you're an R person, you might think, well, Keith, it's hard for me to differentiate between the two as an R stats language, but I, I think it will, it will make more sense as I talk about this trend. Um, what I was saying is that people that would be kind of your SPSS and SAS crowd, I've already told you somewhat my background, the, the risk was some years ago that there'd be so much emphasis, I think appropriate emphasis, but maybe sometimes too much on business understanding, data understanding, and data preparation leading up to modeling. So for instance, I generally will suggest that as a rule of thumb, that let's say I'm doing a 16 week project or a 20 week long project. I hit the modeling phase about 80% of the way in. So if I'm doing a 20 week project, I'm doing modeling about week 16 or 17. Okay. Now you can see the problem, right? If you're within an organization where you're doing agile, how are you going to make that work? Right? If, if if the way that Keith likes to run a project is, I'm not going to build the, I'm not going to build any models. You know, when I mean models, the kind of model that I'm going to deploy. That doesn't mean I'm not experimenting with the modeling algorithms. I mean, doing the serious work of building the model is week 16 or 17 out of 20. Then what on earth are you doing during your stand-up meetings and every, you know, during your sprints up until then? Right? You can see how this is a, an issue to reconcile. And I will tell you that I've talked to a lot of predictive modeling experts and a lot of agile experts, and everybody says, no problem. You know, you, you follow the phases and you do the sprints and you do agile, it's easy to reconcile the two. I know for a fact it is more difficult than you might guess to reconcile the two because I recently had a two or three hour event. It was actually a lot of fun. It was right here in North Carolina, it was in Research Triangle Park. There's a huge Red Hat office here, Cisco, IBM. There's a just uh, 20 minutes from where I'm presenting today, 
there are a ton of high-tech headquarters. It's kind of like a mini, it's not as big as Silicon Valley, but I bet a number of you have heard of Research Triangle Park. There's a lot of headquarters here. So much so there used to be direct flights between here and San Jose all the time, bringing people back and forth between Research Triangle Park and Silicon Valley, somewhat less flying uh, at the moment. But uh, the point of all that is we got together and we had a big group. We had about 50 people in the room. This was just a few weeks ago, by the way, just before uh, people started staying home within two weeks really of that happening. And we talked about it for two or three hours and we found that it was actually pretty tough to honor both at the same time. Now this doesn't mean that you choose between one or the other because I'm not sure that's something we'd be allowed to do anymore. But it means there are some things to learn from these decades of experience in building these predictive models that somehow we have to find a, a way to reconcile with agile. And when I say this is a trend, I don't mean it's a trend towards away from good and towards bad or vice versa. I mean, we're right in the middle of it right now. We're right in the thick of it right now and people have not figured this out, even though we say it's easy. When people say it's easy, it's usually because they're just at this surf surface level of the phases. And they think that business understanding is just kind of the statement of the problem. It's a lot more than that. It's the translation of the business problem into a form that the modeling is capable of. And data prep is a huge issue as well. And I'm going to talk at length about data prep because there's a reason why data prep is 60% of the time. And it's not because it's a burden to be overcome that technology can help us with. It's, there are important reasons why data prep takes 60% of the time. And even though as technology advances, it's still 60% of the time. Okay, so here's what I wanna urge you all to do. I'm not gonna talk about it, but I'm gonna really, really recommend that you do so. Don't assume that the circular diagram is Christy M. So if you Google Christy M and you see the picture, don't think, oh, I've seen that picture before, so I know Christy M. Take the time, spend a half day or a day reading the Christy M document. It's about a 60 or 70 page document. You can find it for free on, online. And you wanna go to the task level. So if you read the Christy M document, you're gonna find that there's a little short chapter, three or four pages on each of these tasks, and there's 24 of them. There's 24 tasks, and there's dozens of documentation requirements as well that talk about this. Now, there's no question this is more linear kind of Gantt chart friendly, not really agile in how it was conceived because it was conceived a couple of years before agile. But please don't assume that the circular diagram is Christy M. Christy M is really having to go a level deeper. So if you're a data science manager and you wanna build effective predictive models, but you live in an organization and agile is a requirement, see what lessons you can take from Christy M and incorporate it into your thinking. I think that's gonna be an important thing for uh, an agile data science manager to do. So next one, and this is really about data prep. And I'm conscious of the fact that we wanna leave plenty of time for questions. I should be able to wrap up within five minutes if that's okay, which would put us about five minutes late, but I think we started about five minutes late. So, I, so my timing is probably just about right. Okay, so the other trend is, is that back when, um, People were arriving with a lot of stats experience. You probably know this about stats. You know, you're supposed to state your hypotheses and you're supposed to do things that really don't make sense in a, in a uh, business analytics context, like go to the university library and determine your hypotheses. That doesn't make any sense because we're always trying to innovate when we do data science. So we, we can't do that. Nonetheless, slow and careful was the way to go, okay? So there was a bit of craft. It was almost like being an artisan in building these models. And when you meet uh, a number of folks that are mid-career with me, uh, you know, some of my uh, kind of heroes that are, are good at this, you'll find that they're, they have a certain knack for doing this that's hard to reduce to a step-by-step -step process. There's a sense of craft. So AutoML is a positive thing, believe me. I want any technology that's gonna help me out. So as a data science manager, you might be thinking about what technology should we commit to? To what degree can we use automation to help us build models? But here's where you wanna watch out. People like me have been automating the modeling process for decades, I mean, really. In 99, when I first learned about the software that I ended up spending you know, a lot of time in over my career, we were already doing this kind of tournament of algorithms where you would let 20 algorithms you know, run and, and it would identify which ones were best. 
that's so well established as a technology. There is nothing wrong with that. So, you know, that's why I usually say that the modeling phase of an extended project is just about one week because you reach diminishing returns quite predictably, right? And a week is usually enough. Where AutoML is less mature and just a little bit riskier, I'm not saying they're not doing good work. I'm not saying that we're not moving towards our goal, but where I'm a bit more skeptical and a lot of my colleagues are a bit more skeptical is the auto data prep. We're just not there yet. We're getting better. There's a lot of interesting things you can do. So that's what I want to emphasize, this sense of craft around data prep. So I have a couple of quotes to share with you and another uh, I don't think <laughs> I don't think one gives homework assignments in a keynote, but but nonetheless, I'll say that in addition to checking out uh, Crisp DM, that I would urge you to Google the nine laws of data mining, the nine laws of data mining. Okay, and I should have put that as a title so that everybody could remember. But uh, uh, and this is the third law. You can also make note of this gentleman's name, Nam, nine, Tom Kabaza. And if you uh, Google Tom Kabaza nine laws, you'll have no problem finding. It's basically an extended blog post that he wrote some years ago, but it's absolutely fabulous. So he makes the claim that data preparation is always more than half of every analytic modeling process. So was he saying that because um, when he wrote that some years ago, you know, we didn't have as much auto data prep as we have now? No, he would say, because I know Tom very well, he would say today that it's still true. Why? People get confused about what data prep is. So if you're managing people or you're managing the process, you have to understand why we do the data prep so that you can allocate the appropriate amount of time and resources to it. And so you can understand the value of it, okay? And again, this does have implications for Agile because it means that um, if you start modeling within the first two weeks, Perhaps data prep doesn't get the attention it deserves. You just have to be careful about that. So what the heck is it? Data prep is really the way that we translate our data into a form that the specific needs of our current modeling project can be accomplished. We don't build models on raw data. So um, one example that I always use, because I think people can relate to, uh, relate to it, let's say I was gonna try to predict diabetes risk. Actually, epidemiology uh, is on everybody's mind because of COVID-19, uh, right? So let's say I was trying to predict diabetes risk. Well, you know, I think we all know that obesity can be a diabetes risk. So you think, wow, you just put height and weight in there and your neural net's going to figure it out. You'd be surprised. It doesn't. If you just do something like height weight ratio or body mass index, if you give that black box technique just a little bit of help, it will do a much better job. So that's what data prep is. It, of course, it's cleaning and other things, but I don't know about everybody else's experience. I find that the data is cleaner and cleaner and cleaner each year. It's still a pain in the neck. It still takes a lot of time, but I'm not talking, when I talk about data prep, I'm not emphasizing data cleaning. I'm talking about the crafting of the data set to be uniquely capable of answering the research question, not really the research question, the, the business application that we have intended for it. And you would think the algorithms can do that for us. I can tell you as of 2020, they can't. You know, and I have a feeling that I'm still gonna be talking about this when I'm closer to retirement age because it's been very, very slow in coming. Automating the modeling algorithms, we started doing that 10, 15 years ago and quite successfully. Automating this is a lot tougher. And I love this quote. Claudia Perlick, if you've never heard the name, is a highly successful data scientist uh, she's a quant now on Wall Street, but she be became famous for winning a lot of Kaggle competitions in KDD, not just doing well, winning them. So she's quite well known within the, you know, the community of kind of the elite data scientists. And I caught this in an interview and I thought it was so great. I typed it and put it on a slide. It was a, it was a YouTube video. And what she's talking about is, yeah, subject matter expertise, data prep, and so on. Yeah, there's a lot of that. And she goes, I love these tools. I like anything that helps me out. I, I like anything that speeds me along. But she said, often we think about this the wrong way. You know, we call it data science. But she says, and I'm quoting her now, I think there's a lot of craft. And I love this line, again, borrowed from her. It's like making shoes. You have to do it 2,000 times before you're any good at it. 
It's that aspect of it that perhaps we're losing a bit because what we tend to do is we'll grab some code. I mean, good working effective code from GitHub, let's say, and we'll run uh, XGBoost and we'll run Random Forest and we'll run all these algorithms and we know how to figure out which of the models are the best, but we're losing the sense of craft. And maybe I'm coming off as a bit old fashioned, but I hope you can tell, you know, I'm not 70 yet. <laughs> you know, I just think it's still the way we do things. And that's something you have to keep in mind as you interface between the business and the data scientists. Again, whether you're in charge of the product or the team, because people increasingly don't understand why anybody should be spending time on data prep. They think technology has addressed this and it hasn't. So I guess this trend is a bit of a risky trend. And finally, and I'll end on this, uh, we know that models are getting increasingly, in, uh, increasingly complex. So what, what's, what's behind this trend? Well, you know, pretty much anybody that's even dabbled in data science, even if you're just on data science 101, you've watched a few videos, you know that some of the older decision tree algorithms aren't quite as good as something like XGBoost. I think mo almost everybody on the call, I'm sure, has heard of XGBoost, even if uh, you don't really emphasize the technical side, you know that's the one that's winning a lot of competitions now. Actually, uh, one that is starting to trend is deep stacking. It has a very strange name. You might think I'm making it up, but it's a real thing. So deep stacking might be the next um, XG boost. We'll see. But here's the problem is that this again gets back to the earlier phases of Chris DM, data understanding in particular. If you jump to the black box technique right away, you never interact with your data. And if you never interact with your data, you don't know what's broken. You don't know what needs to be fixed. So what's happening is there's a trend to build a black box model, but then we need explainability. And there was a great talk, uh, Sai, I'm sure you'll be able to remind me of the name of this gentleman, but there's a talk yesterday and he really emphasized the explainability. I thought he did a really good job at that in yesterday's session. Um, so we understand the motivations for going black box. I deployed black box models myself, but what we're doing is we're compensating for that lack of transparency with XAI, which is explainable AI. And that's really powerful. And that's a huge new trend. And I think in many ways, it's a positive trend, but this is what I urge you to do and make sure you set aside time for your uh, data product development and in managing your data science teams is please, 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 build a transparent model before you attempt the black box model so that if something is broken or missing or incorrect in the data, you know it. I was working with a young guy recently, very good aspiring data science, just about to finish his PhD program, very, very good. He had built a bunch of XG boost models, which were really quite promising. But at my urging, we got in and rolled our sleeves and took a closer look at the data, a step that even if he was with me now would admit that he, he downplayed a bit. But we discovered that he had some variables that were missing 87% of the time or even 97% of the time. And it just wasn't on his radar because he jumped right to the algorithm. So these are trends, they're real trends, they're not necessarily negative trends, but you know, when we gain something, something we lose something. And that's probably been a theme of the, the talk today is that be careful that as we advance and go in these new directions, that we don't forget some of the lessons learned over many years as you manage your projects and manage your teams. Hope I left you a little bit of wiggle room there, Sai. I know it's getting late over there. That's good. So, so uh, yeah, I think, uh, go ahead, Pinkesh. No, no, I, I was gonna say, you know, amazing insights. Um, you know, we've heard about deep learning today. I think I have a whole new appreciation of deep insights. And, um, you know, I think all coming from the trenches, uh, from someone who has uh, been leading the forefront of uh, hiring, setting up uh, data science practices. And, and I think, you know, getting these insights uh, at an early stage of evolution for this role, which we call data science management, I think was just super uh, and, and great timing as well. So truly appreciate uh, you know, all of that. Uh, in fact, there was, um, uh, speaking of polls, I think there was an interesting poll. Uh, if you can put that poll up for the audience. Uh, and, and I think this, this poll is, is probably a collection of uh, cliches that we have heard, uh, uh, you know, at least from the community mm -hmm. here, uh, and to see kind of which of these people believe in. And, and, and I'd like for you to also comment a, a little bit 
um, once you say, because I really liked your, uh, one of the trends, uh, in fact, I think your opening trend that if your data science manager reports to IT, you have a kind of, almost kind of different flavor uh, of the measurement, the KPI and the outcomes versus uh, a line of business. Uh, and I think since this space of data science management is so new, uh, where the word data science and the word manager uh, are sometimes just slapped together just because somebody wanted to manage people uh, and happens to come from a data science team uh, or, or a data science label. And I think, uh, uh, so, so it's good to kind of see these numbers, uh, uh, you know, show up on what, what people think. And it was obviously multiple choices. So you can choose as many um, as you can. Uh, so so it would be interesting to take, take your, you know, uh, get a take from, from you uh, on some of these cliches that we hear quite a bit, you know, some of these kind of internal uh, objections when somebody's wanting to make a career in data science, but they hear these things. Um, and so it'll, it'll be good to kind of demystify some of it. Well, you know, one of the, um, uh, uh, one of the answers here that is kind of, uh, kind of interesting is the data science manager is nothing but a data analyst who manages people, you know, and I'm, I'm sure in some organizations, there's some truth to that because, you know, one of the trends that I was talking about before I even opened the deck was you didn't see data science teams of six or eight people, at least in the client organizations that I was seeing five or 10 years ago, but you see it now. So when there were two data scientists, no one was tempted to have a data science manager, but the moment the team gets to be a half dozen, then naturally you want to make that person a manager, but that doesn't mean that the organization has been thoughtful about the role or defining it or telling that person what's expected of them. Mm -hmm. Any, any specific take on looks like the, the highest voted here. So almost half of the, half of the folks here from a sentiment feel that, look, I've got 10 plus years of experience. You know, I've got uh, a significant amount of experience, perhaps outside of data science. Uh, and yet I now want to move into this uh, exciting role, exciting career, especially with the, uh, with the trends that you kind of talked about. But the feeling is, hey, did I miss the bus? Uh, what's your what's your thought on that as you see the industry uh, in terms of the correlation between the years of experience and now still being able to make that shift uh, into this uh, hard, easy, no. possible, doable? I, I think I think it's doable, and the reason I think it's uh, doable now now we're talking about something that might be more a senior director role than a manager role, but uh, and I've got to think, Pinkesh, you've encountered this too. In many organizations, the data scientists and BI report up to someone. So there's a BI manager and a data science manager, um, but then usually above them, there's someone that's kind of a senior director level that's on that kind of more project and reporting side and not so much on the IT technology side, like the data warehouse folks and stuff like that. And I see that position quite often. So if someone's got a decade or more of experience and they're coming at a related field, there are tons of data scientists because you know they, they both sometimes like and don't like the situation. There are tons of data scientists that report up through a chain that isn't data science itself. But that's, the, that's a really common one that I see is some combination of BI and data science reporting to some kind of director or senior director type role. So if someone, oh, and actually the business analysts usually as well. So sometimes the BI team is kind of like all about the dashboarding and then you've got the ad hoc report team and then you've got the project team. One of the reasons I have a lot of intimate interaction with this is that there will be a lot of data scientists that haven't been able to explain to senior management how to utilize themselves. So they'll find that they get put on the BI dashboarding projects and they go, wow, you know, I'm a coder, I can figure this out, but I, I kind of want to be out there doing deep learning like neural nets. I don't want to be doing dashboarding. It's not what I enjoy. So I know for a fact, there are many organizations where the business analysts, the ad hoc reporting team, the BI team, the data science team all report to a senior director who in turn reports to IT. There's only so many of those positions out there, but that would be one to aspire to. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of people are, are just pouring in uh, a lot of, uh, you know, positive comments and feedback, you know, Natrajan, um, you know, from DXC uh, has also a question on this whole cost center thing. And, you know, if the project mm -hmm. fails, um, you know, or terminates because of the schedule, you know, typically, you know, uh, if, so how, how do you, how do you 
in a in a project context, it's more about quality and 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 time, right? Um, and it may not be as much as the outcome, which sometimes is unpredictable. So, what what's your take on that? When uh, it looks like a, a conflicting thing to Natrajan and many other others who have asked this question. Well, uh, the trick is you can't uh, you can't do an effective back of the envelope ROI without doing some detective work. And in a sense, you can't do the detective work until the project starts. So it sometimes becomes kind of a chicken or an egg thing. So the, the feeling is you, 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 there must be no choice but to start the project and then some of them might fail. I think the better way to do it is you have to break off the business understanding phase of Christie M is almost like its own mini project. So you have to take a couple of weeks and this is something that could fit within the time frame of a sprint. Now, I know that just because you do it in two weeks doesn't mean that it's agile. There's a lot of more course. agile than that. But nonetheless, yeah. within an organization where that's really important, you can do this within a couple of weeks. So I think what the trick is to do a very thorough vetting process. And you know, I can't get into it now, but Christy M is quite detailed about what business understanding is. It's not just the translation, it's also this vetting process of whether this project will work. And if we always took two weeks to thoroughly vet a project, I think fewer projects would fail and more projects would make their way to deployment. Excellent. So, so I pull the plug during that phase quite often. I would like to think, well, historically, let's knock on wood, this will trend will continue. I don't find the two thirds of the way into a project, I have to pull, on, pull a plug in a project very often. That's hopefully extremely rare. But I will gladly pull the plug a week into a project during that vetting process. But there's an art to it, and it takes some, takes some experience to do it well. Very good. Uh, just acknowledging, uh, you know, uh, Raghu and uh, Jee Srinivasan from Ession Labs, uh, you know, Praveen uh, Kumar uh, from uh, Chrysalis, and Natrajan uh, Naruli from Shell. Uh, I think a lot of them really enjoyed the session, kind of great insights, uh, learnings. Uh, many of you have asked some questions. I think we're just out of, out of time. Uh, and so I think... Um, uh, if it's possible, Keith, uh, you know, do take a look at the questions on the on the LinkedIn thread, uh, and I strongly recommend you follow, uh, you know, Keith. I think, like I said earlier, there's a lot of insights that uh, you know he keeps on driving, not just through his LinkedIn courses, which obviously are available to uh, a lot of us in the world, uh, but also even um, you know otherwise to kind of commentary on what's happening. So, uh, super uh, session, and, and truly appreciate you spending the time, Keith. Uh, uh, all the way from Raleigh uh, to connect with folks uh, here in India, and hopefully uh, we'll see you here in person one of these days as well. Once the once the lockdown gets better, I would I would very much enjoy that. I'll make I'll make one final comment about the about the about the following. Um, uh, you know, LinkedIn puts a limit on connecting, so uh, so I, I can't connect with everybody, especially folks that I don't know. But um, but following is a great way to do it. And you did make the point that you know, maybe not everybody would have access to the courses, but I post one or two videos a week in my feed. So if someone follows me, um, over time, they would be getting, uh, you know, getting things. Usually it's because someone asks about it, so I just post the video and so on. And some of that is uh, course content, but it, uh, it trickles, through the, uh, trickles through the feed, so they may, uh, they may enjoy that. Excellent. Well, once again, thank you uh, for taking the time and uh, spending, spending with this community. Uh, it was super exciting to host you here today, Keith. Okay, thanks everybody.